the Lord's Prayer. And last week, we looked at that one phrase in that prayer, thy kingdom come. And we want to look at it one more time today. Thy kingdom come. You know, the coming of the kingdom of Jesus is quite complicated. It's not too complicated that once we look at it and try to understand as Jesus would unfold it, uh, that we can't fully understand it. We can, but it is complicated on the surface. And why is it complicated? Because it is both now and not yet. And that makes it complicated. The kingdom that Jesus came to bring is present and yet future. It is existing right now, but it doesn't exist fully until another day. This makes this kingdom of God concept very complicated. Makes it complicated. And as we looked at that last time, we looked at the whole aspect of the kingdom of God in the here and now. That when Jesus, the king, shows up on earth, and when he comes with miracles and casting out demons, and even laying down his life and raising up from the dead, he was saying, the kingdom has come. How do we know that? Well, John the Baptist, who was the forerunner to Jesus, had one message. He spoke this one message in different ways, but these words he repeated most. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what he meant by it being at hand, the kingdom of heaven is here because King Jesus is here. And as the forerunner, he was trying to tell people, this kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is about Jesus. The one I am not worthy to untie his shoes. It's about him. And wherever he is, wherever he dwells and exists, the kingdom of God has come. And what makes this complicated is that Jesus came in this earthly being. He was born of the virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, and rose again from the dead on the third day. And he did all of this in inaugurating or in the initial phase of the kingdom. That's what makes this complicated. The kingdom has come, but it hasn't finally been consummated. The kingdom has come, but it's not in its completion. Makes it hard. But it also gives us victory in the days to come. If you would like to read about the kingdom of God, I would recommend for your reading the works of George Eldon Ladd. George Eldon Ladd. Now, that's not easy reading. Don't think you're going to just buzz through a lot of his things. It's going to be deep. It's going to take you into some depths. But one of his books that I have loved, and there, and there are three of them, actually, I, I brought today and left them in my, my briefcase down here. But the one I like the most is The Gospel of the Kingdom by George Eldon Ladd. Ladd was a theologian and he taught at Fuller Seminary out in California for many years. Uh, he died many years ago. But George Eldon Ladd in the Gospel of the Kingdom said this, that when we pray the prayer, thy kingdom come, when we pray that, it is a petition for God to reign. That's what that's about. When we pray thy kingdom come, we are asking God to reign, to manifest his kingly sovereignty and power and to put to flight every enemy of righteousness and of his divine rule, that God alone may be king over the world. That's what we're praying. We're asking God to take up his rule. So when you pray thy kingdom come, what you're asking God to do is to reign and rule in your life. That's what you're asking him. You can't pray this prayer lightly and say, I'll live any way I want to. It's, it's a submission to God. Thy kingdom come. Let it come to me. And when we're praying that, we're saying, come over the earth. Let people come under your righteous, loving, and merciful rule. That's the kingdom of God. 
Well, last week I had mentioned this concept that the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of Jesus. And what is he after? He wants to free people from their sins. That's the passage we just read in Revelation chapter 1. That to him, that's Jesus who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And what did he do? He made us to be a kingdom. It's fascinating terminology. The rule and reign of Jesus to free people from their sins and also from satanic powers. You know, the devil, if we want to call him devil, the accuser, the evil one, is active in our world. And what he's trying to do is blind us to our need of Jesus and to keep us beat up and bound up. Jesus came to set you free from that. All of it. Because the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of Jesus to free people from their sins and from satanic oppression. From satanic powers. But he's after something. He wants you to rule with him. The rule and reign of Jesus to free people from their sins and satanic powers is the kingdom of God. But here's the purpose. So they might rule and reign with him on the earth. That's awesome. Now you may have followed that a little bit last time, but I've added a few scriptures just for your thought theologically so we can use this framework to move into Luke 17. All right, so look at the passages here that I have from the book of Revelation. This is the last book of the Bible. It is summing up all things. As we saw in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus frees people from their sins so they can be the kingdom and serve God. That's what he's after. In Revelation 5.10, it is repeated. Jesus, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, but now he adds the purpose and they will reign on the earth. That's the first time we see that in Revelation. You made them to be a kingdom for this purpose. That they, meaning you and me, would reign on the earth. That is picked up again in Revelation chapter 20. Where it says in the final days, there is a group of people that come to life. They, the graves open up. They come back to life. And it says they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And so what we see in the scheme of the kingdom is that Jesus has come and he's announced his kingdom. And with power he saves us. And he releases us from demonic oppression. And he, and he forgives our sins and redeems us and puts us in a new kingdom. And as we begin to move in that new kingdom, he is saying, I want you to reign on earth. And then I've chosen that reign to last a thousand years. Now let's get some people kind of confused. But in the course of events, here's what's going to happen. Jesus is on his way back. When? We don't know. But when he shows up, he is not going to just suspend in air. Some people think that. One time I, I was in an ordination council trying to uh, ordain a couple of guys for ministry. And, and I, asked the, I asked one of the guys, I said, where's Jesus going to land on earth? And one of the ministers behind me said... He's not going to land on earth. He's coming in the air. Well, he is coming in the air, but he's coming to earth. Why? Well, that's a complicated answer. Why? But to put it in a summary fashion is this. He's coming back to take charge. That's what he wants to do. You see, Jesus isn't after us just saying, hold on by faith, grit your teeth, and at the end of it all, it's just all over, and we just go to heaven, and we go, Phew, glad that's over. That isn't what Jesus is after. He is after coming back to earth and taking what is rightfully his. Now listen to what happened. Here's what happened. You could read this in Genesis chapter 1. So just follow in summary fashion. In Genesis chapter 1 it says this. God created male and female. And he told them here's what I want you to do. I want you to multiply and fill the earth. That's happening. 
even as we speak. We're having children all being born in this church. But he says this, multiply and fill the earth. And then he says this, I want you to rule. Isn't that interesting? Rule over the fishes of the sea and the birds of the air. In other words, I have given earth so that you, God is saying, you people working with me, Adam and Eve and those who would follow, I want you to rule. Well, guess what happened? Adam and Eve received that word, and they probably began their first steps in it, but there was a deceiver called Satan. And he came and he tempted them to take authority in their own power rather than continuing to be under the authority of God and ruling as his representative. Oh, you don't have to be God's representative. <laughs> Listen, God wants you to rule. You do not have to be his representative. You can be God yourself. And so they disobeyed God. He told them not to eat off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, living a separate life from him, figuring out life without God involved. And they took and they ate. And death came upon the earth. But what the Bible says is that Adam and Eve, now I hope you're following this, it can be a little complicated, but what Adam and Eve did is they surrendered their rightful right to rule. And they gave it over to Satan. And now he is called, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world, lower G. And he is at work in the world. So why do we have suffering and, and hardship and evil? Why do bad things happen to people? Why do we get sick? Why do things happen like that? It all goes back to this very thing at the very beginning of the Bible that there was a kingdom concept. I want you to rule people, but they gave it away. And now we have a, t a rough taskmaster and dictator who beats us up and binds us up and Jesus is going to beat him and deliver the world and everyone who follows him. So what people who put their faith in Jesus today, listen, if you today have put your faith and you're walking in Jesus, you have tasted the good things that are to come. But it is a taste. It's not the full completion. You've only gotten a taste. But what is the taste? I'm no longer guilty. I am no longer shameful. I'm no longer blinded. I am no longer bound. And I get to walk in the freedom of what the Bible calls the sons of God. I get to walk in freedom. And I taste the good things that God is going to bring on the earth in its fullness when Jesus returns. Make sense? There's a kingdom. Adam and Eve, it's called the world. And I want you to rule. Okay, we'll rule. But we're going to rule our way. We're going to be our own God. We're going to have our own destiny. And in doing so, they handed the kingdom, they handed the world over to an evil dictator. And when Jesus comes back, he is going to bound and bind up that devil, Satan, for a thousand years. That's where we get the passage in Revelation 20. Now, why does Jesus want to do that literally? Not figuratively, literally. It's because he is redeeming everything. The Bible says that he's reconciling all things to Jesus. In other words, putting things that have been lost, things that have gone under a different ruler. He is reconciling everything to be under Jesus. And when he comes back, it happens. Until then, it happens only in those who follow Jesus. Make sense? Okay, how do I state it better? The kingdom is about ruling and reigning. Our ancient ancestors gave it away. Jesus is giving it back. And that's the gospel. I want you to rule and reign with me. 
Now, because we are just giving a summary fashion, the thousand years ends. Jesus has bound Satan, and he has set up his rule in Jerusalem, and he's sitting on the throne of David, the king of Israel and the king of the earth. And for a thousand years, there's peace. But according to God's mysterious plan that I can't always fully explain nor even understand, he releases Satan after the thousand years. Guess what happens? He goes back out to deceive. And the world ends up worse than it is today. With the battle of Armageddon, Jesus comes to set up his rule and reign in his second coming for a thousand years. But after Satan is released, there's another battle. And it's called the battle of Gog and Magog. And when that battle hits, the destiny of this earth is fire. It's going to be burned up. Is that a nuclear holocaust? I don't know. But it's going to burn up. And then what he's going to do is create a new existence called a new heaven and a new earth. Now, if that sounds strange to you, it does to me. Join the club. But that's the plan of God for the kingdom. And so we read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, that these believers and followers of Christ came to life and they reigned for a thousand years. But then after that thousand years, the world is destroyed and a new world is put in its place. And that's where we find Revelation 22. Look at the passage. In the new heaven and new earth, Revelation 22 verses 3 through 5, you have it before you. In that kingdom, in that eternal kingdom, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve him. Remember how that's been repeated in Revelation chapter 1? He's made us a big kingdom and priests to serve God. He wants us to reign on earth. How do we do that? By serving God. Revelation 5.10. So here it's repeated. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the lamp of a light, excuse me, a light of a lamp, or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And notice this, and they will reign. They will reign. They will reign forever and ever. Now, boy, the destiny of people is to once again place ourselves rightfully under the rule of God and rule and reign with Him, with Jesus. That's the destiny of people who follow Christ. And He wants us to live in that. Where we serve Him, we don't tell Him to serve us. We serve Him, we live for Him, we exalt Him, we worship Him, and we do His bidding throughout all of the world. And forever and ever, we will reign with him. So why is Jesus coming back? He's coming back to stake claim to what was lost. That's the earth. He's going to stake claim to a people who have put their faith in him and follow him. And in that claim, he says, come on, I want you to reign with me. What a gospel. Now, we're ready for Luke 17. (laughs) You're saying, no, we're not. As we've given a cliff note version of the kingdom. People in Jesus' day didn't get it. Just like we don't get it. And so it says in Luke 17 verse 20, what we looked at last week once on Uh, On being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come. See, they expected something to come. When would it be? And Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. I'm with you. I am king. You've got to be rightly aligned with me. 
And so here's the present work of the kingdom is that Jesus comes to live within a person and establishes his rule. He stakes a claim on our life. He didn't tell the Pharisees any other theology that I brought with you. He didn't tell them anything because the one thing they resisted was, will you let me rule you? If you won't let me rule you, then I can't tell you about ruling the earth. It all begins with a humble submission before Jesus. And say, Jesus, I receive you as Lord and Savior. And I submit my life unto you, freed from my sins because of your blood. That's the wonder of the gospel. But when he got alone with his disciples, he said, let me tell you what they were asking. I won't give them because they're resisting on the entry level. They are resisting on the inauguration of the kingdom. They resist me in the initial phase of the kingdom. If they don't get that right, they can't get the rest of it. But you, you, Peter, James, or excuse me, Peter, John, James, come here. Bartholomew, come here. And he said to them, here's what he said, in verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, and he's talking about the consummation of the kingdom when it comes in glory. He said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by his generation. What Jesus tells his disciples who had already chosen to follow after him, I'm going to tell you about the kingdom's consummation, the future what will happen. And he prefaces all of this to say this first. The kingdom's consummation will be delayed. Get that down. What Jesus is teaching in this paragraph is that the kingdom's consummation or its completion in its final form will be delayed. Now he didn't tell that to the other guys. That's why they didn't get it. This is why we understand Jesus died and rose again over 2,000 years ago, but he still hasn't come back. He didn't tell us how long it'd be delayed. He just simply said it would be delayed. And I want to give you some things to give you hope in the delay. All right? He tells them three things about how to keep hopeful in the kingdom's delay. The kingdom will be delayed. Here's how I want you to keep hopeful. I want you to understand that the world's going to get bad and you're going to long for me to appear. So the first thing is understanding longing. I don't know about you, but I've walked with Jesus for 40 years and life isn't easy. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever had A stress or a sickness that you couldn't explain. And you prayed and you trusted God. But the answer seems delayed because it isn't happening yet. And we go, ah. Have you ever said in those moments of your deep authenticity before God, how long? How long? Have you ever done that? Well, Jesus said, rather than thinking something is peculiar or wrong with the kingdom or wrong with you, I just want you to realize in the delay of the kingdom, there will be a longing within you. A longing for Jesus to come and set this place right. And so he's telling his first disciples, you can remain in hope if you realize the longing you have for the king. 
Well, I, I know these longings. You can read about them. Job 7, 4. He says, when I lie down, I think, how long before I get up? He was sick and hurting. A passage that I've already led you to in, in Psalm 13. The first two verses, four times it asks, how long, Lord? How long? And as Revelation continues to unfold, in Revelation 6.10, there are people who have been beheaded, they're martyrs for Jesus, and they're up in heaven, and they're asking God, how long? How long before you come and avenge our blood and make this right? And they were told, wait, wait. It's coming, but you wait. I believe what Jesus is trying to get those Christ followers who were close to him and walking with him is to realize the suffering in our day and what it does in us. It can break your faith and leave it trampled on the ground or it can build your faith if you realize longing. I long for you, God. I long for you. Next thing that he says, I'm going to give you a warning. In this delay, there's a longing and there's a warning. And here is the warning. You pragmatic people who want a quick fix to all the problems will be duped if you don't understand this warning. There will be people come and they will actually speak in my name. And they will say, I am the second coming of Christ. That's what Sung Young Moon did. He, he's dead now, and I guess he got that issue cleared up. But, <laughs> but in all of his wealth, and he bought the University of Bridgeport. But if you were to listen to Sun Young Moon and the Moonies teaching, they believed he was the second coming of Christ. But here's what Jesus is saying. I give you a warning. I'm not coming back in another form. I'm not coming back in another person. It's not going to be like, well, this person does miracles and this person has a neat truth and this person seems to bring about global peace. Don't follow them. Here's the big warning in this delay. Friends, we better not be caught. We better not be caught in these cults. Anyone who ever tells you, I am God's gift. David Koresh said it. And we had to have our guys bravely storm the gates with guns unfurled. Because he said, I'm the second coming of Christ. Jesus said, this is going to happen. So if you're going to remain hopeful, don't go grabbing after people. Keep looking, waiting for me. I will come the way I left. You're going to see me in the sky. It's going to be like lightning flashing. You will know the day. So don't get duped by a bunch of dummies. The last thing that he says in this first section, and we're just talking about the delay, and I can see that I will have to delay other things, but that's okay. I do this before. Not only is there a longing and a, and a warning, but he explains this, and with this I'll close today. He gives a reason for the delay. There's a reason. And here's what he said the reason is. Verse 25. He says, but first, the Messiah Jesus must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Here's the reason for the delay. The kingdom is not like any kingdom of this world. Before he's going to ride in on a horse of victory, he's going to ride on a donkey into Jerusalem and die. And that tells us something right up front. This kingdom will be delayed because I've got a gospel activity I am going to do by dying on the cross and I'm going to free people. 
Now, it may not seem like a delay because he could come back right in the moment that he died. And that's what they expected. That's what the first followers thought. He's coming back. It's now. And we're supposed to live with that same kind of now anticipation. But he said, this kingdom is different. It is about my death long before it is about my coming back to set the world right. And I want you to know. So if we're going to be people of hope, we have to grab these three things. We have to realize that there's going to be longing and there's a warning, uh, but there's also a reason for the delay, and that is the gospel work of God. Now, how do I know that? Well, I'll conclude by reading you a passage. The passage that I want to read you is from 2 Peter. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to just simply bow your head. I'll give you the passage. It's chapter 3, verses 3 to 11. But I'd just like to read it in closing, if you'd allow me that privilege. So you just bow your head and kind of close your eyes because the kingdom that is coming in its completion is on delay. From our perspective, it's on delay. And here's the word that Peter would give his final letter before he died. Above all, he writes, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they, deliberately forget that long ago by God's word the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water and by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed by the same word the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for a, the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why is the kingdom in its completion delayed? In the sovereign plan of God, he delays the final coming of Jesus so that you and I might come into the kingdom through faith in Christ right now. Because he knows, he knows this. When Jesus comes back the final time, it's too late. When he comes back, that consummation of the kingdom will be sudden and severe. He knows that when he comes back, the second time, the kingdom will bring final and complete judgment. And because he knows that, he delays the kingdom's consummation. You see, the heart of God is that he wants to judge no one. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to judge it. I came to save it. We read in the Old Testament that it's a strange work of God to judge. He's holy and just and he will do it. But in the heart of hearts, in the God of the universe, is the heart of a father. What good, what joy would there be if anyone suffer in eternity? He will do that when pushed 
to its completion. He will do that. But he says it's a strange work. Because I'm different. I want you to be saved. The kingdom is on delay at this moment. Could come right now. He could. But it's on delay in this moment. Because God loves people. And he wants them to live forever and reign with him. So what does that mean about you? The kingdom is yours. Simply receive the king. What does it mean about your family members? It means pray. It means talk to God. Ask him to be at work. Reach out to my, these that I love. What does it mean about your coworkers? It doesn't mean you've got to carry a Bible tomorrow to work. You've got to thump it or be religious. It doesn't mean any of that. It does mean live for the king. And when the opportunities arise, tell them about the king. Why? Because he's coming. And he wants them. What does it mean about bombings in Boston? Shootings in Newtown? It means this. The king is coming. 